All right. So just continuing with where we were on the topic of timing analysis, right? There is one additional piece of terminology that I would like to introduce. This is the concept of slack. Okay. So what exactly is slack in a circuit, right? How is it computed, and why is it useful? Okay. So the idea is something like this. In a typical circuit, when you are doing timing analysis, you will have something of this sort. You will have one flip flop, you will have some combinational logic, and the output of that goes into another flip flop. Okay. Clock arrives at the first flip flop, has some delay, arrives at the second flip flop. Right? The delay could be negative depending on how the clock is rooted. Okay. So, we can essentially define a couple of things over here, right? We know that TCQ is the amount of time required for the data to come through here, right? And T combinational is, T com max is the maximum delay through the combinational logic, which means that if the input changed at some time T, at T plus T com max, we are sure that the output of the combinational logic will now be stable. Okay, that's the definition of propagation delay. Okay, of course it is defined as the 50% point and so on, but effectively once it crosses 50%, we are assuming that it is a proper logic value. More importantly, what I mean by stable is, it has changed, it is not going to go back to the previous logic value during this period of computation for these inputs. Okay, which means that effectively what I can do is, I can define something called the arrival time. at this point, right, is essentially the time of the clock arrival here, right, plus the time required to go through the flip flop TCQ plus the combinational delay, okay. There is another thing I can define over here, which is the required arrival time. Okay. So, what is the required arrival time at the input of the second flip flop? It should be no later than what? T2, is it just T2? Yes. T2 minus T setup. Okay. Right? Just think of it. Just in terms of the meanings of those words. This is the actual arrival time, this is the required arrival time. Okay. In practice, almost all timing analysis is done in terms of these parameters, the arrival time and the required arrival time, okay? Because what happens in a real circuit, a real large circuit is, it is not really feasible to sort of just do all the, you know, shortest path analysis and all in a straightforward manner without, the main reason being that each flip flop has its own clock associated with it, meaning that there is some delay in the clock coming to each flip flop, okay? So when you have something of that sort, it is easier to think about it in terms of this arrival time and required arrival time. Okay? What that means is I can now also specify required arrival time at any point in the circuit, maybe at an output of the circuit, not at a flip flop. Right? For a flip flop, of course, I know that the arrival required arrival time is whatever whenever the clock is going to arrive there minus T setup. Okay? At an output pin of the circuit, I can impose a required arrival time requirement. Right? I can say that it should be no later than this time instant, okay, related to whatever clocks that I am applying to the circuit. Okay? The usual short form for this is of course just AT and this is RAT. Right? What I have written over here is the so called late mode analysis. Right? So, this is the late arrival time and the late required arrival time. Okay? 
at the second flip flop okay and what what is the condition that must be satisfied for correct operation of the circuit huh? it is less than or equal to rat right so as long as at is less than or equal to rat correct operation of the circuit okay in fact we go one step further and define the slack as rat minus at okay so in other words we have got one number which tells us how much better than required we are doing right in other words if the slack is a large positive quantity that's good news for us right it basically means that this part that we have got or the clock period that we have chosen is comfortably meeting our requirements we do not have any problems with respect to time okay but if slack becomes zero right at that point we essentially say that this path is critical okay so what does critical mean it means that any increase in the delay along that path either the tcq or the t set uh, or the t setup or the t combinational if any one of those parameters increases right or if the clock period decreases the slack will become negative right slack becoming negative essentially means that there will be a timing violation at this on this path right in this case the setup time will be violated at the destination flip flop okay so this slack can be used as a measure of how close our circuit is to it's sort of maximum performance right how can i increase the slack without worrying about anything else the simplest way to increase slack over here is just increase the clock period right so t2 minus t1 in other words right that will be the clock period plus whatever skew is there right so t1 and t2 are typically related by the clock period but if there is a skew between them then t2 will be clock period plus skew right so the simplest way of making slack positive is to increase the clock period right but usually that's not what we want to do what we want to do is make sure that the circuit can meet a certain clock period requirement right in which case we do all this analysis and work out all the slacks at different points right then if we find that the delay on some path is not good enough we need to fix it how can we fix it we need to reduce the delay how can we reduce the delay through a combinational circuit what are the things that you can think of to reduce delay through a combinational circuit logic huh logic optimization meaning what you rearrange the gates that is one possibility right definitely so if you can do restructuring of the logic right then that might be one way of doing it but remember what we discussed a few classes ago what is it that actually impacts the delay not just the type of gates but also the sizes of the gates right in fact the size of the gates are probably more important because otherwise what you would have said is for example a four input nand gate the simplest implementation is just have a single four input nand right but we saw an example where it makes more sense to sort of do nand 2 inverter nand 2 inverter or at least in nand 2 inverter that kind of a combination states right multiple stage implementation okay so restructuring the logic has to be taken along with choosing the correct sizes okay so things like logical effort can help you over there but ultimately the main thing to keep in mind is what is your goal you want to reduce the delay on the path okay what are the techniques available to you one is changing the type of logic the other is changing the size of the gates okay there are also possibilities such as for example you might have a library where you have multiple threshold voltages okay so what does that mean what why would i why would i have a library with multiple threshold voltages on it what i'm saying in other words is i have a library where there are two types of inverters okay one is with a high vt the other is with a low vt okay 
under which conditions would I choose which one? When would I choose the inverter with a low VT? When would I prefer to use an inverter with a low value for threshold voltage? What does a low threshold voltage mean in terms of current? More current, therefore, if my inverter can deliver more current, what does that imply in terms of? Huh? It's faster. Okay. So a low VT should typically be faster. What's the problem? Power. Okay. What kind of power? Is the dynamic power going to be a problem? The switching power. What is the equation for switching power that we had? Half CVDD square F, right? Per transition. Or rather, half CVDD square per transition. So, CVDD square per 0, 1, 0 transition. Does VT figure anywhere in it? No, it is not directly dependent on VT. It might have some secondary effect due to the maximum currents and so on, but directly it does not seem to depend on VT. So then where does power get affected by VT? Huh? What? Suppression leakage. Right? So low, low VT is used when you want to have high speed because it has larger currents. Right? But higher VT helps you from the point of things like leakage. The subthreshold leakage, for example, right? If I have a higher value of VT, then when I actually turn off the transistor, I have like gone that many levels below that, you know, S times thermal voltage that we talked about, right? After all, we have a factor of 10 decrease in the subthreshold current for every some 60 to 90 millivolts of drop, right? So the larger the value of VT, the more off the transistor is in some sense, okay? lower leakage ok but it will be slow right so in such a situation going back to our discussion of slack supposing I find that I have a particular path in a circuit and it has positive slack what is it that I am likely to try over there in terms of improving the circuit Huh? Right? Replace some of the gates at least in my combinational logic. Try and push them to a higher value of VT. Okay? What will happen? The circuit will slow down, but I have positive slack. Right? So I can afford to do that to some extent. So the overall circuit does not slow down, it still operates at my required frequency. That path slows down a little bit. But it's still better than the worst case path. It's still better than my requirement, in other words. Okay. The advantage is I have now reduced my leakage. Okay. So leakage can be leakage versus speed can be a trade-off that we do. Okay. So that is one possible thing that you can do once you can measure slack on every path in the circuit. Okay. So in fact, one of the things which is done, right? When we talked about timing analysis, for the most part, I just talked about finding out which is the most critical path through a circuit or which is the path that determines your clock period. That's the first step. The next step would be, for as many paths as possible, can I find out what the slack is or can I find out which are the worst paths in terms of slack, right? So, a sort of more complex version of the same timing analysis problem is saying, okay, don't just give me which is the worst path give me the top 10 or top 100 worst paths, the ones with the least amount of slack. Okay? Then I will try and sort of modify all of them in such a way that I can either improve the slack on those or if I, or I can reverse the question, ask which are the ones with the maximum amount of slack and see whether I can use some other trade-off. Right? Can I lower the, uh, increase the VT on those and lower the leakage power. 
okay now what we discussed over here is the so called late mode analysis right we also have an early mode okay in early mode what are we saying what is the earliest time at which data can arrive at the input of the second flip flop let's look at that I'll use this notation FF2 colon D essentially indicates the D input of flip flop 2. Right? D input of flip flop 2. Okay? So, what is the earliest possible arrival at FF2 colon D? It is P1 early, the earliest possible arrival of the clock at the input of FF1. plus TCQ, right, plus the minimum combinational delay. Again, TCQ also, if I had like TCQ min and max, I need to take TCQ min, okay. This is the earliest arrival time, I will call it ADE, okay. What is the required arrival time? In this case, the required arrival time is actually T2 plus THD and my requirement is that the arrival time must be greater than the required arrival time in this case. Okay? So, this is early mode. Yeah. Yeah, so essentially what we are saying is in late mode, I am talking about what is the latest possible time at which a signal can arrive at the input of a flip flop. Okay? And I want to know what is the constraint I should write corresponding to that. Okay? That is what this is. Right? So, for example, in late mode, what we are saying is the earliest possible arrival time at the input of a second flip flop is the late clock or rather, you know, let me see, not the earliest arrival time, this is basically the time at which the input is guaranteed to be stable is late clock at the first flip flop plus TCQ plus maximum combinational delay. Okay? So, this is the latest point at which the data can change at the input of flip flop 2. Okay? What we require is that must be that must be uh, that must be such that it is less than the required arrival time for the next clock cycle at flip flop 2. Okay. So, in other words, T2 over here will be T1 plus T clock plus S. Right? Whereas over here, T2 will be just T1 plus S. Okay. So, what is the difference? Depending on which constraint I am trying to find out, whether it is an early mode constraint or a late mode constraint, I need to know which clock I am interested in. Am I interested in the present clock cycle at the destination flip flop or the next clock cycle at the destination flip flop? Late mode is concerned with the next clock cycle. Early mode is concerned with same clock cycle. I do not want the data to run through two flip flops at once. Exactly. So, early mode analysis is saying what is the earliest point at which I can have a change in the input of FF2, right? When will that happen? Clock arrives at FF1 early, data goes through TCQ, it runs through the combinational logic with minimum delay, that is the earliest point at which the data can become present at FF2, okay? That must not cause a whole violation on FF2, right? Meaning that FF2 is also seeing a clock edge around the same time, either exactly at T1 or at T1 plus some S, right? 
it has a hold time constraint of some t hold whatever this fast path that i had through the logic must make sure that it changes the data only after this hold time constraint at f of t okay so effectively what we have is these are the two constraints there is an early arrival time and the early required arrival time now my requirement is that the arrival time must be greater than or equal to required arrival time and the slack correspondingly the early slack is defined as the at e minus rat once again a positive value for slack is good news okay it means that the data will not change too early and will not cause hold violations okay so both of these things are essentially ways by which we can make use of we can just directly write out these constraints we can do an arrival time analysis so how can we do arrival time analysis right think about a large circuit right it will have lots of flip flops okay there will be lots of parts in between over here right what can you do with this the best thing best way to do analysis is say i don't care about the fact that the flip flops are anywhere you know in between in the middle of the circuit i only care about analysis from one set of flip flops to the next set right i will break this up okay and i will put all flip flop outputs as my first stage then i will have all my logic over here finally going through to flip flop inputs this entire segment over here will be a so called feed forward only right feed forward meaning that all the direction of the logic is only in one way from left to right in this case why is that right so this actually tells us something more this is a requirement it is possible to construct a circuit where i would actually have some connections going backwards what we are saying is if you have such a connection you cannot do timing analysis on that which means that for a normal synchronous circuit i should never have any feedback edges nothing going backwards okay in once i draw the circuit like this right what does a feedback loop mean in practice it means that your circuit looks something like this so for example the simplest feedback loop that we can think of is this not permitted for see, uh, synchronous sequential circuits and other kind of feedback loop that you might be familiar with is this so does this mean that these circuits are not permitted at all obviously not they are useful right they form the core structure of latches so you will use such kinds of circuits it's just that what we are saying is when you are constructing normal logic circuits and you are trying to do timing analysis on it the internal part the combination logic that we have written should not have any loops of this sort if it has loops then you essentially cannot do a meaningful timing analysis on it okay think about it what does it mean to actually talk about the arrival time at a particular node then i have a feedback loop so then i'll say okay the output of this inverter it will come at some time 10 picoseconds at 20 picoseconds it will come back to the input at 30 it will come to the output 40 it will be back at the input 50 it will be at the output and so on right i have a sort of oscillator or something or a feedback loop essentially right i cannot do a timing analysis on this so we put a artificial constraint saying that if you want to do timing analysis then the circuit should not have such feedback loops okay 
in the absence of feedback loops, it turns out that you can break up any circuit into a structure which looks like this. All flip-flop outputs are on the left hand side, all combinational logic goes from left to right, all flip-flop inputs are on the right hand side. Okay, so I have essentially taken each flip-flop and just split it into input and output separately. Now what do I need to do? I can essentially say what is the arrival time at the output of each flip-flop. How do I know that? I know the clock at each flip-flop, I know the TCQ of each flip-flop, I know the arrival time there. I can propagate through the logic. If the arrival time at the output of one flip-flop is so much, the arrival time at the next output of the next combinational gate is that plus the delay through the combinational gate and so on. Okay, until I reach the final stage. Okay. So this is how timing analysis is generally done in practice. What we are finally interested in is to find out what are the slacks. Okay. If any circuit has a negative slack, that is a problem which needs to get fixed before you can actually finalize the design. Okay. There are multiple ways by which you can fix it change the sizes, change the threshold voltage, change the type of logic, maybe even go all the way down to the place and route level and change the type of metal which you use for the routing. Okay? So there are a few different tricks you can use in order to fix timing, which is usually what sort of the back end VLSI design is all about. Right? Going and saying, okay, once I have done the layout, how do I fix all these errors that create? Okay. Alright, so all of this with, is with regard to the definition of slack. Like I said, one of the uses of slack is if you have a positive slack somewhere, it means that you can trade it off for an improvement in power, typically leakage power, maybe some other criterion also. Okay. Alright, now all of this discussion so far was with respect to edge triggered flip flops. Okay. Next question that we can ask is, are synchronous circuits built only with edge triggered flip flops or instead if I use level triggered latches, then what are the, are there similar kind of constraints that I need to satisfy and if so, what are they? Okay. So what does timing analysis and level triggered latches mean? Effectively what we are saying over there is a latch once again has a clock signal, it has a data input and a Q output. What this actually means is while C is equal to 0, the data is not allowed to change. Right? But now while it is equal to 1, it can change as many times as the data changes. The output can change as many times as the input changes. Okay? So this one in other words gets killed, but this and this go through and this, okay, because they all fall in the time when C is equal to 1, okay. So now what does it mean to talk about setup time or hold time? Is it meaningful at all? Where am I likely to have a problem in such a circuit? After all, what are setup or hold constraints? What were they for? They were essentially saying if the data changes too close to that rising edge of the clock, there is a chance that it can go wrong, meaning that either the wrong data gets latched in or in fact it goes into a metastable condition and takes a long time to get out of that. That's the metastability is the more serious problem. Okay? Is there anything, I mean after all even these latches are built the same way, they are also built using back to back inverters. right? So even they can go metastable. The question is, where in this timing diagram is there a possibility of metastability coming in? During which transition? Okay, right. So, more or less correct. Just think about it. So the uh, answer was that we now need to be concerned about the transitions, right? Then it's going from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0. Go one step further, do you care about the 0 to 1 transition? What is happening at the 0 to 1 transition for a positive latch? It is becoming transparent, right? 
is there any chance what does it mean by becoming transparent the feedback loop has been broken or at least is being like you know you are put in a more powerful drive so it is forcing some data into the feedback loop okay but typically if you are using it with multiplexers or with transmission gates the feedback loop will actually be broken at the 0 to 1 transition can there be any meta stability then without feedback there is no meta stability right so the 0 to 1 transition is not a problem the 1 to 0 transition is a problem right because if i have some data changing very close to that 1 to 0 transition at some point what is happening is i am cutting off the input and connecting the feedback okay if the input is changing very close to that there is a possibility that it has driven that intermediate node to somewhere around vdd by 2 and the entire system can go meta stable right when i cut out the input and connect the feedback there is a possibility of going meta stable at that stage okay so this edge in other words will have set up and hold constraints the following edge right keep that in mind for a positive level triggered latch that is to say when c is equal to 1 it is transparent the problem happens when c is going to 0 when it is becoming frozen ok when it is becoming transparent you don't really have any issues because the feedback is off you will never go meta stable but when it is becoming frozen there is a chance that you can become meta stable and therefore it is at the following edge that you need to be concerned about your timing constraints right that's all you need to know rest of it in terms of how do i define arrival time required arrival time slack so on are pretty much the same as for the edge triggered flip flops right once again i can think of what is the actual arrival time at an uh, at a particular point what is the required arrival time it should be before that corresponding falling edge right minus t setup and so on okay and that's all you can just do the rest of your timing analysis that right a side effect of that right is the fact that for these level triggered latches in some sense i actually have some extra time to do certain computation okay what do i mean by that let's see if we can take an example and make that a bit more clear right now First consider a edge triggered flip flop circuit like this. This is the clock, some input over here, combinational logic delay, output. Okay. Let's say you know forget T setup, T C Q, T hold. Right? Even if they are zero, I still need to have the constraints in place. It's just that they will not contribute extra to those margins. Right, I still need to have two combinational logic should be less than the clock period, for example. Okay, so I will ignore those for the time being, and let's just see if we can write down the timing constraints for this. What I would have is t clock must be greater than or equal to the t combinational logic. Right? Let's say this is twenty nanoseconds. So that is it, you just get one number saying t clock must be greater than 20 nanoseconds. Okay. Now, supposing I was implementing this using level triggered latches. Okay. What I am doing in some sense is, I am sort of making something which looks like the master slave configuration, right? But using explicit level triggered latches that are being separated out in this way. Okay? Now, if that happens, effectively what I am saying is, when does the data 
start coming out through this. Huh? Any time after clock becomes equal to 1, right? So from the time the clock becomes equal to 1, this data can come out over here, out of the first latch. Okay? It will go through the combinational logic of the first one. First stage, take on 1 I will call it. Right? When will it start passing through L2? What is the earliest time at which it can pass through L2? Is it even dependent on TCOM? Assume that TCOM is small. Huh? Is it T clock? T clock by 2. Right? Assuming that it's a 50% duty cycle clock. Right? So in other words, what I'm saying is clock looks like this. Clock bar looks like this. Okay. This first transition happens somewhere here. Anytime after clock has gone high. TCOM, right? If TCOM was small, what will happen is it will be ready over here. But it cannot pass through L2 because L2 is not yet transparent. Okay? So what does it do? It waits until L2 becomes transparent and then starts going through the logic. Okay? So this will be the clock to queue delay of L2. Right? Then let me then take on 2. And once again, it is going to remain until this point. Right? So this becomes slack. Same way, this becomes slack at the other end. Right? Normally, what I would do is I would take that T comb and break it up into two parts: 10 nanoseconds, 10 nanoseconds, and put each one in one half clock period, so that my overall clock period remains the same, 20 nanoseconds as before. Okay. So if I have slack like this on either side, where the data gets ready before the next edge of the clock, before the edge required for the next latch to become transparent, then everything is fine. I don't have any issues. Okay. So in other words, if my circuit looks something like this, TCOM 1, this is TCOM 2, everything works over here. T is greater than TCOM 1 plus TCOM 2. Okay. Let's say that this is equal to 10 nanoseconds, this is equal to 10 nanoseconds, we are all fine. Okay. But think about what is happening at the second flip flop, the second latch. Right? What is actually happening over there is any time during that part where it's equal to 1, if the input changes, it will be allowed to go through. So what if TCOM 1 was 15 nanoseconds instead of 10 nanoseconds? And it gets ready only midway through clock bar equal to 1. What will happen once it becomes ready? It will go through the latch. Right? 
the second phase, the second part, right? If it finished within five nanoseconds, once again we are back to the original condition, right? We are once again finished within one clock second. Okay. So in other words, what has happened is instead of having to break that overall combinational logic into two equal parts, 10 plus 10, I can break it as 15 plus 5 and it will still work. Okay? Because I had this latch. If that was all there is to it, there is nothing particularly fancy. Right? The interesting thing is, TCOM 2 need not be restricted to 5 nanoseconds. That could still be a bit more, it could be 10 nanoseconds. What will happen if TCOM 2 still takes 10 nanoseconds? It will spill into the next part for L3 where clock becomes equal to 1, right? It will spill into the L3 portion that still will pass through correctly, okay? So in other words, we will have a situation where This is 15 nanoseconds, this is 10 nanoseconds, the clock period is equal to 20 nanoseconds, it does not have to be 25, okay? Why did this happen? Because the data was allowed to change any time during the path that the large input clock was equal to 1, not only at the edge. Okay. Up to that half clock cycle until the point where that clock bar actually turns off and becomes opaque, any time up to that point I am allowed to change T comp 1 or comp 1. Okay. This phenomenon is called time boil. Okay. What we have done is we have taken our overall combinational logic split it up in such a way that the clocks that are applied to the different latches are such that the combinational logic sort of borrows half a clock cycle from the next stage. How long can you do this? Totally you can borrow only half a clock cycle, right? But if you have many stages, 10 stages, right? It is possible that some of the earlier stages are slightly bigger, later stages are slightly smaller. Each one maximum can borrow up to half a clock cycle and the entire system will work. So any individual stage does not need to be sort of smaller than that 2 by 2. It can be slightly larger and the overall system will still work. Okay? This is a slightly tricky concept. Please go back and think clearly about what exactly is involved in time borrowing. Right? All that we are saying is because of the fact that I am no longer constraining myself just to the edge for the transition, I am allowing some extra time, any time that the clock is equal to 1, I am allowing the data to go through. So even if the data is slightly late, the circuit will be forgiving, right? It is sort of like saying that, okay, you know, class starts at 8 o'clock, up to 8.15 you are allowed to come in, right? So it sort of gives you that leeway. You can come in, the data can arrive at that flip-flop slightly late, it will still go through. How late? Before the sort of closing gate happens, right? That is before that large clock falls and cuts it off, okay? So is it just that we are, you know, are we just sort of saying that, yeah, you know, I mean, we are allowing some, a longer clock period? No, we are actually saying that by using the old clock period, 20 nanoseconds, I am allowing individual stages to be more than 2 by 2, which would never have been possible with the regular edge trigger setup. Okay? So in that sense, this time borrowing is useful, of course you can make use of it directly while doing analysis, uh, while doing design itself, but more importantly it also means that if you have some uncertainty in your logic delays, this kind of circuit will be slightly more forgiving of that. It will allow you some extra delay on one side provided that the other side is going to make up for it by being a little shorter. Okay? So time borrowing can be used in latches in order to get some slightly better design. The problem is it complicates your analysis quite a lot. Okay? You can of course still write down your arrival time, required arrival time, those kind of constraints and compute all of them. 
but in general sort of doing design and analysis becomes a little bit more tricky whenever you use latches especially if you start doing things like time borrow okay so the preferred way of design is typically to use edge triggered flip flops and just do the static timing analysis at one shot with those okay time borrowing is something that is typically used in very high performance circuits or high end circuits where you actually want to squeeze out that little bit extra performance or you want it to be a bit more robust and not so concerned about clock edges okay all right we'll stop here for now